Okay, well, I think we'll, we'll get started. Um, so welcome everyone for Michael's uh, third and final lecture. Um, and the rules are as before, if you have questions, just feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Uh, alternatively, uh, there can be a lot of discussion in the chat and just make sure that you address all questions or comments to uh, everybody so that we can all participate and so Michael doesn't need to moderate it himself. Um, okay, anyway, Michael, do you want to get started? Okay, sure. Um, so I thought I'd just start off by um, recalling uh, where we got to last time. Um, oh, has that, has that vanished from the, oh yeah. Hopefully everyone can see this. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to recall where we got to last time. So one of the, the main ideas that we saw last time was this formula here, uh, where we actually express the, the Q Whitaker polynomials uh, in terms of the principally specialized whole Lidowitz polynomials. So there was a procedure that we looked at in quite a bit of detail uh, yesterday where we take a whole Lidowitz polynomial and we do some geometric uh, specializations of the, the variables. And then at the end of the day, there's some limit to perform. And what pops out of this is the, the Q Whitaker polynomial. And we really just prove this directly from the dual Cauchy identity. Um, so we know that by doing this procedure, we should get the Q Whitaker polynomials. But on the other hand, you might wonder what does this actually do at the level of the partition functions? And in order to answer this question, uh, we had to go basically via the, the technique of fusion. And so we looked a little bit at fusion last time. And in particular, we looked at this type of fusion. So this is the fusion that was giving you the, the whole Lidowitz polynomials from the six vertex model wave functions. And using that, we, we went on to derive some formulas. And I'd like to in particular recall this one here. Um, so this one expression for the whole Lidowitz polynomials in terms of this Q boson model. Um, and essentially you have L particles uh, entering through the bottom of um, this bundle here, the, the zeroth bundle, and then they split up and they migrate to the top of, of these bundles here uh, with multiplicities that coincide with the multiplicities of the partition that you're looking at. So what we're going to do now is take this formula here and now perform the, the principal specializations or the geometric progressions in the X variables. And we know that when we do this, we're gonna get Q Whitakers. So we're just going to quote the result. Uh, we're not actually gonna go through fusion uh, because it's rather tedious. Um, this is what happens. So in the Q Whitaker case, um, you get this, this doubly fused um, vertex model here. So now I have uh, an intersection of two fat lines and the, the states that live on the fat lines, um, they can assume any non-negative integer values. So, um, well, actually what I'm stating here is, is actually the colored version. So what's written here is, is the full higher rank version that you get when you perform double fusion. So actually the, the A, B, C, and D here, um, these are vectors that, that live in this space here. So just by taking n-fold Cartesian product of um, the non-negative integers, right? And essentially you look at those vectors and the components of the vectors will tell you the number of particles of a given color that you have um, on any one of those edges of the vertex. Okay, so when you do the double fusion, um, you end up getting this formula here, um, which is really very elegant formula, um, at least in my opinion. Uh, and the reason why this is so nice is this is actually a positive formula in Q. So what you're obtaining here is actually just um, polynomial in Q. 
and also polynomial in the u variable. So the u variable, um, this is like the spectral parameter um, as previously. And you see that the way it depends on u is in the simplest possible way. So it's just u to the d, where this d here is the, the vector that goes out on the right. So all you have to do is just sum together all of the components of that d, and that tells you the power of u that you get uh, for such a vertex. And then there is some q-dependence, um, which we won't go into too much here, um, but we'll look at two special cases of this formula. So the first special case is where n is equal to one. Um, so that's when you get back down to the, to the usual black and white um, vertex model um, that is coming directly from fusion of the six vertex model. And for this, you get these, these really simple weights. So now instead of having vectors um, you know, around the, the four edges of the vertex, um, we just have integer states now, or if you like, vectors of one component. And this is the formula you get here. So you have some indicator function. Indicator function is, as usual, just um, telling us that we have conservation of particles through the vertex. So namely, whatever comes in has to go out. And that's all that's being expressed here. And then you get this Q binomial coefficient. Um, which only depends, as we see here, on, on these two states here. So it has no dependence on B and C whatsoever. And we also get a U to the D. Okay, so this is a really, really simple formula. Um, you, you really couldn't hope for a simpler formula after performing double fusion. Um, and then there's another special case which um, is also very nice, and that's again this rainbow case. So in the rainbow case, um, each of the colors um, appear at most once. And in terms of the vectors, what it means is those four vectors now, uh, these are all going to be binary strings, so just zeros and ones, that either tell you whether you have a particle of that color present or whether it's, it's not present. Okay. And in this case, um, again, we have this, this um, well, we have the, the same indicator function as before, but this is again expressing conservation through the vertex. Uh, but now we get this other indicator function. And actually this is descending from the, you'll notice in the general formula, we actually have this, uh, this product of Q binomials. And in the product of Q binomials, it's implicit that um, this AI here has to be at least as big as the, as the DI. And so that's the reason why uh, we actually get this, this constraint here. So uh, another way of saying that um, is that you cannot have a color which is present in D, uh, which is not also present in A. So yeah, cannot have a color present in D, which is not also present in the, in the vector A. And in this case, it's, it's very nice because the dependence on Q um, is just a simple power of Q. So you actually don't even have this binomial coefficient anymore. Uh, you just get a pure power of Q and a pure power of U. So this is really as refined as you can get. This really breaks your, your binomial coefficient down into just simple powers of, of Q. Um, so this, yeah, I really like this, this formula for the weights. Um, and the exponent um, that we have here for the Q, uh, this is actually counting something very, very simple. Um, you look at a vertex, and in that vertex, for every pair of colors um, such that i is less than j, every time you have the color i you know, turning the corner as it does here, and the color J going straight up, every time this happens with I being less than J, then this will add one to the, to the count of this, uh, of this theta here. So theta is just counting all such pairs. And that is just the very simple uh, combinatorics that, that you have in this case. So now we come to the, to the result. Um, and this result is, is totally expected in view of uh, what we've been with polynomials. 
uh, really all the changes is in the expression we have now, each of these uh, horizontal lines, uh, they get replaced by a fat horizontal line. And so each of those fat vertices now um, would be one of uh, these ones that we had in the, in the generic model. And so we get this, this formula here. Again, there's some overall normalization, uh, which is not too important. And again, the constraints on these vectors, uh, the A's and the B's, um, this is exactly the same constraints that we met in the previous lecture. So um, in particular, you have the conservation property here. So whatever enters or has to leave via the ensemble of states that you have at the top. And you also have the, the fact that the sum of all the components of A um, has to be equal to L and the sum of the components of BI should be equal to the, to the ith part multiplicity of, of the partition. And so this is a, is a colored formula um, in terms of these colored vertex models for the Q-Whitaker polynomials. So there are some papers in the, in the recent literature um, expressing uh, Q Whitaker polynomials in terms of rank one vertex models. Um, but as far as I know, this is the, the first um, sort of fully colored uh, version of the Q Whitakers. Um, but if somebody knows differently, then they should correct me. Um, okay. And so, and one little fact to, to conclude um, what was supposed to have been the second lecture. Um, if we just take the partition function that, that we drew up here, so, so this one, and let's just rotate it back in 80 degrees and then flip the orientations of all the lines. So I'm just doing something very, very naive. Uh, if I rotate it by 180 degrees, then you'll get this picture here. And the claim is that this partition function where I've just rotated everything, um, this is also giving me the Q-Whitaker polynomial. The only difference is now I don't have to include um, this normalization factor that I had previously. And the reason why you have this formula um, is there's a sort of um, gauge transformation that you can perform, um, which basically does this rotation vertices up to some overall factor, which is precisely this factor here. So this is the expression you get. Um, Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, I might be slightly behind the lecture, but um, if you look at the expression you get for the Q-Whitaker polynomial, is that not just the inverse multinomial coefficient? Why the fancy name? Um, this one. This is, this is exactly um, the inverse of, yeah. of Multinom multinomial, that's but, correct. Well, not exactly. You miss, I think, one part, maybe, like ah, M0. Uh, but, no, do, yes. Yeah, but otherwise, it's just that. So why does it need a separate name? Oh, concept. Sorry, this probably sounds very dumb. <laughs> oh, so, so I have called it Q multinomial, yes. Um, oh, yes, so, OK. I missed this part, sorry. Yeah, uh, but I, I think guess. the point is also like the um, here m m zero should be equal to zero because this is really m zero here. So, um, so I think I'm correct in calling this Q multinomial. But uh, yeah. Well, in any case, regardless of the name um, that it's given, um, you have this factor, and the factor goes away when you when you rotate by by 180 degrees. Thank you, sir, for interrupting. So, um, so I would like to, uh, at this point, actually show um, little pictures that um, you're actually able to generate by drawing these partition functions in Mathematica. Um, so I'll just show it very quickly, but it will give you an idea of you know what what's actually uh, what's actually going on when you when you work out these partition functions. So I will share I will share that now. Um, okay. So hopefully, 
everyone can see this. Um, if it's not good, someone should should let me know now. Um, so these are the kind of um, kind of diagrams that that you get. Um, so all right. So what's actually happening here? So so this is the the 180 degree um, rotated version of the of the partition function, and here I'm just chopping off the. There would normally be a column um, that lives on the right edge of these pictures. But what happens in this column is completely deterministic. So um, it is simply deleted from the picture. So, so that column has gone away. And uh, so this is what you get. Um, so here, this is for the partition uh, for one. And I'm looking at it in, uh, in three variables. And so what we have to actually do is work out the dual partition because it is the dual partition which is actually, uh, actually used to encode the, uh, the object. So the dual partition for this one is two one one one, and so now we actually see that here we have this um, we have this red particle, uh, which is exiting at position two, and then we have the three other colored particles that are exiting at position one, and they represent the the ones here. And so you you go through and you get all of these terms, and it, I think it's it's rather beautiful because actually all of the uh, dependence on on the Q is is completely split up into individual powers. So this is like a fully refined version of the of the Q Whitakers um, without any binomial coefficients uh, whatsoever, and in a way a very natural generalization of say the, the standard Young Tableau version for um, for the Shaw functions. So you know, maybe let's do one more example. Um, uh, let's maybe do three, two, one. Yeah, the code is a little bit slow. It's certainly not optimized for speed, but we see we get uh, something like this. So in this case, the uh, the, the pol polynomial is quite a bit simpler. Um, but yeah, this is just hopefully to convince you that um, you know you can actually use this formula to compute and get this nice combinatorial expression. Um, okay. So now I will go back to the beginning of, of the next lecture. Okay. All right. So the final lecture, um, I wanted to say something about um, some other types of partition functions that you can get uh, using these these colored vertex models. And Michael, uh, there was there was one question in the, the chat uh, or okay. comment, uh, basically asking how your uh, formulas for colored Q Whitaker functions relate to Gerasimov, Lebedev, and Oblazin's work. Okay, Alexei is responding. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, that's fine. All right. Yeah, don't worry, Michael, carry on. We'll, we'll talk to Red separately. Okay, all right. Yeah, so I, I've, I've actually got quite a lot to get through on, in this one as well. So um, yeah, I better keep moving. Okay, so, um, so this one, yeah, we're gonna look at um, some partition functions that you you get in these in these colored vertex models, but the the flavor of the of the procedure here is rather different. Um, so actually, we're going to take a small detour um, via the theory of the Hecke algebra um, of type a n minus one, and we're also going to touch on the non-symmetric McDonald polynomials, and finally, we'll culminate in giving a, a formula for for the McDonald polynomials themselves. And that formula for the McDonald polynomials, uh, when you take the degeneration to Q Whitaker, uh, which is obtained by setting one of the parameters to zero, um, you get another formula for the Q Whitaker polynomials. And this one is completely different from the one that I've just shown. So in the one that I've just shown, you know, you have some planar partition function with paths which propagate from here to here. 
and you have some sort of Q statistic every time paths cross over or something like this. Um, the formula that we're about to see is, is quite different. In this case, you get powers of Q whenever you wrap around the cylinder. And so this, to my mind, looks completely different to the other one. And I think it's very interesting um, to try and understand the, the correspondence. OK. So let's begin um, with this lecture. So all right, so I've started off with some very basic stuff here. Um, so as everyone here will know, symmetric group um, S sub n, this is generated by the set of simple transpositions S1 up to Sn minus 1. And they satisfy these, these relations here, um, usually known as braid relations. Um, yeah, so this is uh, what you get by multiplying three of these transposition, transpositions together. Um, this, when you actually represent this pictorially, you get something which looks very much like uh, the yang baxter equation, actually. And this, um, this relation here is just saying if you square any of your generators, of course, you get the identity. And as we've also seen, the symmetric group um, well, it has a natural action on functions in the alphabet x1 up to xn, um, and in particular on, uh, on polynomials, although you can define it on any, any function in n variables. And the action is just the transposition of, of two variables. Okay, so the, the Hecke algebra of, of type an minus one is a kind of, uh, I guess, quantum deformation of this algebra. It's one way that you might think of it. Um, and so it's generated by, it's, it's customary to use the letter T for the generators of, of the Hecke algebra. And they satisfy relations that look very similar um, in the case of the symmetric group. So again, you have this uh, kind of trilinear um, relation involving the Ti's, but now the, the quadratic relation um, this looks a bit different now. So it's actually a Q deformation of the, of the, the relation that we had above. So here I have introduced this Q parameter now, and that Q is precisely the same Q that we've seen all throughout the lectures. And obviously when Q tends to one, we will get back down to uh, just the, the algebra satisfied by the SIs. So this is the Hecke algebra. And this also has a natural action on functions in n variables. And this representation um, is referred to as polynomial representation. So what happens here is we will identify T sub i now by this, this operator here. So this thing is, is, you should think of it as you, you multiply a function by this operator. And so what, what is the operator part? Well, it's, it's given by this part here. So here I just have a one minus a transposition SI where the transposition is acting um, in the way that is defined here. So this is going to compute for you the, the difference between you know, acting by the identity and switching those two variables, XI and XI plus one. And when you perform such a, such a switch, um, what you will get is something from which you can divide xi and xi plus one, which is duly done here. So this whole, uh, this whole expression that I'm circling now, um, this is usually referred to as divided difference operator. Um, but then once we have done that, um, actually, if you're acting on a polynomial, what you will do here is to actually lower the degree of the polynomial. And so actually to restore the degree, you then multiply by this factor up here. And so it's a very easy check, um, little computation, uh, that if you actually plug in this expression for the Ti's into the, into the algebra here, uh, you get faithful representation of, of the algebra. And so for us, the, the important thing to note here is when these operators act on polynomials, um, they remain polynomials. 
Okay, so that's precisely in view of, of what I was saying here. Um, all right, so this is polynomial representation of the Hecke algebra. All right, so then there is um, an, an extension of the Hecke algebra, um, which is due to Chirednik, uh, which is known as the double affine Hecke algebra. And so what happens in the double affine Hecke algebra is you, you supplement uh, your generators by this list of generators. So I have now some capital X generators, uh, X1 up to Xn, and I have the capital Y generators, Y1 up to Yn. And uh, so these things, they satisfy some uh, relations with respect to themselves and also with respect to the things as, as defined up here. But I'm not going to list the, all of the relations. I'm just going to give uh, what they actually look like in the polynomial representation. And so this is what they are. So the, the capital Xi is a very simple uh, action. It's just multiplication by uh, little x sub i. So that's all the capital X's are in the polynomial representation. So in particular, they will raise the degree of the thing that you're looking at by one. On the other hand, the, the y's are represented by something uh, rather more complicated. So I have here a product of uh, these t inverses. All of these are in the polynomial representation. And then I have here a product of t's. And in the middle, we have some, some other operator, uh, usually denoted by omega. And omega has, has the following action on functions in n variables. So you take a function in n variables and what it does is to cycle the variables around by one step and it also multiplies the, the final variable or if you like the first variable um, by some other indeterminate which we're going to denote by p. So actually um, from this now we actually get a second indeterminate. So now we have a p and that is completely independent of, of the Q that we have introduced so far. Okay. And I should point out that again, my notation is, is relatively non-standard. Um, in, uh, in the usual McDonald's literature, um, this, this Q here would be represented by a T and the, the P would actually be represented by a Q. So uh, hopefully this won't cause any confusion, but Q was already in use, so I had to resort to P. I think P and Q is, is kind of nicer anyway, so. All right. all right. So we have these affine generators, the Xi's and the Yi's, and the remarkable thing about the, the, the Daha, double affine Hecke algebra, um, is if you look at the relation of the xi's with the t's, and then if you compare that with the relations that you get of the yi's with the t's, uh, you actually get the same list of, of relations. It's just in one case you'll have x written, and in the other case you'll have y written. But basically with respect to the t's, the x's and the y's behave in the same fashion. So this is really the, the remarkable feature of, of the Daha. And we're not going to record all the relations, but there is one, one relation that is, that is very important. Um, and that is that these, these generators commute with themselves. So this one will not surprise anyone um, because after all, we're just multiplying the functions by X so this is obvious that these two operators are going to commute. But what is not obvious is the fact that the y's actually commute amongst themselves for all i and j, um, which can be proved um, directly from, from the formula that we have up here. All right. So this is the Daha. Okay, so then from the Daha, one gets very naturally to the, the non-symmetric McDonald polynomials. So it's very natural in, in mathematical physics 
uh, whenever you have a set of commuting quantities um, to ask yourselves about the joint eigenfunctions of those operators. And so here we have some non-trivial operators, these y's that are commuting. And so we can ask ourselves for uh, the polynomial eigenfunctions of those operators. And so the non-symmetric McDonald polynomials are simply defined as the, the, the joint eigenfunctions of the yi operators. And they are unique um, up to normalization. In what follows, I'm not going to pay any attention to the, to the issue of normalization. So all of my formulas um, should be taken up to normalization. So this is the this is the eigenrelation. So the the y i's acting on the on the e's. Um, this this gives you this this simple um, well the simple monomial in uh, in p and in q, um, and then we get back the the non-symmetric McDonald polynomial. And so non-symmetric McDonald polynomials. Uh, the natural indexing set that you use here is the set of um, compositions. So compositions are just going to be vectors of non-negative integers. And so that's in contradistinction with what you have when you have symmetric functions. Symmetric functions are uh, typically indexed by partitions um, where you actually you know, don't care about the way that you the parts are ordered canonically in uh, in decreasing fashion but here you actually care about the order so the indexing set for these non-symmetric objects is bigger than it would be in the symmetric case all right so um yeah what can we say about these exponents here well this exponent is pretty simple it's just the ith part of the composition that you're looking at and then you have this uh, much more complicated exponent um, which accompanies the, the Q parameter. Um, we're not going to say too much about that. Um, but we're going to one of that exponent that happens. Take your composition to have um, this weekly increasing order here. By the way, it's telling me my internet connection is unstable. So I hope, yeah, I hope the, the thing is audible. Um, so in this special case here, um, what you find is that exponent actually simplifies and you end up getting uh, just this. So this you know, typically this exponent is, is kind of cumbersome to, to actually calculate, but in this special case, um, we get this, this simplification. All right, so we'll be using this fact uh, a little bit later. Okay, so now two, two theorems um, related to the, the non-symmetric McDonald polynomials. Um, so here is the first one, so let's, let's fix um, a lambda which has n parts, and this is going to be a partition. And what we will do here is to define um, some space V lambda, which is just going to be the linear span of, of the E mu's, where the mu's that you include here are all of the ones such that when you take the sort of the, the composition, you get lambda, all right? So this is, basically all mu's such that when you permute the, the parts, you can actually permute it to, to the partition that you're looking at. So let's look at this space. And so the claim is that in that space, there is a unique, again, up to normalization, symmetric polynomial. And this thing is precisely the symmetric McDonald polynomial, which we spoke about in the last lecture, but, um, we didn't actually define explicitly. So this is one way of defining uh, the symmetric McDonald polynomials. All right. And the second thing is kind of simple fact actually, um, this space is actually closed under the action 
of the of the Hecke generators. So in other words, another way of stating this is if I take an E mu corresponding to, to some composition and I start acting on it with these Hecke generators, um, I will never get outside of, of the space that I'm looking at here. So I'll always end up going to some other E new say where the new is just a permutation of the mu that I started off with. So these are these the two facts that we have. Okay. And some other facts um, which I sort of mentioned verbally last time but didn't really um, didn't really say anything explicitly about. Um, and so that is that the whole literate polynomials uh, we can get to them by taking this limit here. So we take the limit where p goes to zero, and in that case, only one parameter survives, which is the q, and you get back to whole little bit. And the q-whitaker polynomials, uh, these we recover by sending the other variable to zero. So we will have to send q to zero, and then in order to be notationally consistent, then we have to switch up p to a q. So then I've done this here. And this will give you the, the q Whitakers. All right. So basically out of the McDonald's, um, we should be able to recover um, both of those families that, that we've so far been interested in. OK. So, um, so maybe someone who's been monitoring the, the chat, can, can someone tell me if there are any sort of questions at this stage or? Um, I think Alexia has been responding pretty good. I think it's all fine. You can, you can carry on. Okay, thanks. All right. So, all right. So now I would like to um, show some of the steps of how we can actually get a partition function representation of the, of the McDonald polynomials. So I'm not going to go through all of the details, but sort of the more tractable parts of the argument um, will go through. So let's recall this definition that we had in, in lecture one. So this was this, this partition function that we denoted by the, the little f. And the, the indexing data here was these k's, which are the coordinates of the, of the particles at the top. And there were two other things here, which were these uh, vectors or compositions that tell us about the ensemble of colors that, that, that comes in and the ensemble of colors that, that leaves at the top. All right, so this was the object that, that we had. And so now we're going to do um, a little computation. And when we do the computation, uh, we actually will not care at all about the the values of those k's, so those coordinates, this will play absolutely no role in the argument. And not, neither will we care about the, the permutation of colors that we have at the top. So all of that data at the top is irrelevant in the following proposition. So we're going to prove this. So we will assume that we're looking at a composition mu, um, which satisfies this. So if I look at the the ith part and the i plus one part, um, they need to satisfy this, uh, this weak inequality that we have here. And so here is the claim. So if I act on that f function with this, this Hecke generator now, so this is the Hecke algebra generator in the polynomial representation. Now the claim is under that action, what we get back is another f, where in this f, what happens is we, um, we take the, the incoming composition and we permute two of the colors. Um, in particular, we, we permute mu i and mu i plus one. And nothing else changes. Everything else is exactly the same. And there's also a factor of q that we get from, from doing this. Okay, so now let's, let's give the proof of that. All right, so the proof, um, I have to do the proof in a little bit of detail because um, this is actually an argument that we saw already. So we saw this in the first lecture. Um, we had this unzipping argument, which we used to prove 
uh, the symmetry in those six vertex wave functions, right? Well, here we will not have symmetry anymore. And actually, I think in the, in the first lecture, um, someone asked the question, what happens when you do it in the colored case? Um, so this will now answer the question. All right. So here is the argument repeated once again. So this is the, this is our F that we start off with. And we, we multiply it by this, this empty, empty vertex. Okay. So that's, that's something that we saw before. We can put that vertex in for free um, because it's frozen with weight one. So we can just include it. And then once we include it, we can use yang baxter equation to start to move it in the, in the direction of the arrows. And it goes through until it comes out from the left side. And this is the, this is the picture that you get at the end of the day. All right. So if we were in the six vertex case, um, at this point, we would just take that, that vertex there and just delete it um, because it would be frozen. But here it is not frozen because actually the, uh, the, the two particles that we have here are of different colors. So I should, at this point, I should have actually pointed out that what I'm looking at here I'm actually assuming here that mu i is, is actually strictly greater than mu i plus one. So in, in the statement of the, uh, of the proposition, we allowed equality between those two parts, all right? I'll come back to the case where you can have equality at the very end, because um, that's rather simple. So let's assume that we have strict uh, inequality between those two things. And so what we have to do now is actually take the, the, the vertex, which is, which is jutting out from the left, and we have to expand it over the two possible outcomes that you can have. So yeah, in this, in this, in this colored situation, we can have this first vertex where the two colors just cross over. And we can have this one where the colors bounce off each other. And the, the weights that you get here uh, are indicated uh, underneath. All right. And notice that in those weights, it depends on the ratio of, of xi and xi plus one, um, which is always the case when you have one of these vertices, you have to take the ratio of the two, of the two parameters. Right. So now if we, yeah, if we take this, this diagram here, which is supposed to be equal to the thing that we started off with, we take that diagram and now we just expand that vertex into the sum of those two functions. And what we'll end up with then is some identity that relates three Fs, three different Fs. And this is the relation written algebraically now. So here is the, this is the F that we start off with. And this is the, the two Fs that you get by expanding that, that colored vertex. Again, we, we just have some rational functions here which um, need to be carefully calculated, but they're not so important for the purposes of what we have to say here. Um, okay, so in this expression, you can see the first one um, here I have uh, SI acting on mu, and that corresponds with, with this case. Because in this case, you can actually see the, the two colors, they, they switch their order. So that's the reason why they, you get this permutation in acting on the composition. And in the second case, we actually just get the, the same composition because here you see the, the colors did not reverse their order. And what else to say about this? Um, we also need to bear in mind that the, the two parameters now actually got reversed because in this, uh, in this picture here, uh, once you actually you know, strip away this cross, the, the, the spectral parameters that live you know, here, um, they will actually switch their order. So that's the reason why we have to perform the, the, the switch here and here. 
And then we do a little bit more manipulation. Um, and so there's some manipulation. We have to also switch Xi and Xi plus one. And we end up getting this now, um, which is just slightly different form from what we had above. But the point is here, um, everything that's written here, this is precisely what you get by acting with, with the Hecker, Hecker generator. So just to remind you, the, the Hecker generator T sub i was equal to Q minus Xi, Q Xi plus one over Xi xi plus one and then one minus si. So that's the expression that, that you have and you can pretty easily see now that when I expand that thing out and act on an f, um, I will get basically everything that, that's written here. And the, the thing that we get on the right hand side is just q times this, this f here with the permutation of those two parts of the composition. Okay, and so this, this actually proves the, proves the result in the case where the, the two parts of the partition satisfy this strict inequality here. So what about if the two parts were equal? Well, if the two parts were equal, um, then the, the two colors that we would have here, uh, then those two colors will be the same. And in that case, you get back down to the same argument that we had in the six vertex model case. And so in the case where the two colors are equal, you actually just have symmetry um, in those two variables. And the action of the Hecker generator on, on something which is symmetric in those two variables um, will just give you um, Q times the polynomial. In so, why is that true? I mean, you can go back to the um, back to the formula, which was here. So all of this stuff here. So when I act on something which is symmetric in xi and xi plus one, uh, this this thing here is just going to vanish. So all of this will will go away, and I'll just be left with q multiplying the the object. And so that's, that, that's how we prove the, the, the statement in the case where the two parts are equal. All right. Okay, so we've, we've accomplished some things here. So we have now these, uh, these colored vertex models and have certain partition functions that satisfy nice exchange relations under the action of the Hecke generators. Um, and so, you know, using this, this kind of setup, it's very tempting now to head towards the, the Eigen relation that we have for the non-symmetric McDonald polynomials, because after all, the, the Eigen relation for non-symmetric McDonald polynomials involves those Y operators and the Y operators are just built out of the Hecker generators. So we're sort of set up to, to be, be able to perform this kind of uh, computation. All right. So what we're going to do, um, so in the following, I'm just going to drop the, the dependence on nu and the coordinates K1 up to Kn, I'm just going to uh, eliminate this from the notation. And we'll just write now F with the superscript mu. So that's not to say that this stuff here is not important. Um, in fact, it is crucially important as we'll see in just a second, but I just want to suppress it for the moment. Okay. So in view of the, the proposition that we have just proved, um, we actually end up with, with another one now, um, which is the following. So I'm going to restrict myself to, to compositions which have an anti-dominant ordering. So this is these compositions which, for which the parts satisfy this, incre this weak increasing uh, property 
written here. And as we have seen, um, when we looked at the, the eigenvalues for the Y operators, um, in the case of compositions that satisfy this property, the, the eigenvalue actually simplifies and the form of the eigenvalue is precisely this um, in that special case. And so now here is the claim, the action of the yi acting on this partition function, the f mu, well, explicitly, what is it? It's just this, this big product of t's. And the claim is when we act with that product of t's on such an f, we will indeed get this, this eigenvalue here from performing this action. With one caveat, which is a big caveat, which I'll come to below in a second, um, but just to give you some idea of, of how this thing is actually working. So what you do is you start off with the action of the, of the TI inverse and well, TI inverse acting on this, on this F mu, we actually know how to compute it because in view of the fact that we're looking at an anti-dominant composition, we know that mu i has to be less than or equal to mu i plus one. And we're acting with ti inverse. So it's the inverse of the, of the thing that we had above. And so acting with ti inverse on a composition that satisfies that property, um, it will satisfy that nice exchange relation that we saw. So we'll actually be able to use that exchange relation. And it sort of sets off a chain reaction where you, know, you keep acting with all of the T's that we have here and they all act nicely on that F. So that's the, the first part. Then we have to worry about the, the omega operation, which is a big headache. But then once we take care of the omega operation, we then just have another product of T's and again, that product of T's ends up having the, the desired exchange relation that you want. And so what you should think of what's really happening here, uh, let's just go back to the picture. Um, yeah, maybe this picture has been uh, too graffitied so far. Um, so what you're really doing is you're starting off with, say this blue particle here, and what happens under the action of the Y operators is that that blue particle will actually get sent up to the top. So it will start migrating upwards and all of the other ones will just get shifted down. And so it gets to the top and then somehow we have to be able to transfer it all the way back down to the bottom. And then once it gets to the bottom, we will start acting again and bring it up to its, restore it to its starting position. So this is how the, the eigenrelation is going to work at the level of the pictures. And so really the, the sticking point is how can we get that blue particle once it's at the top, how can we actually transfer it back down to the bottom again? So this is really the key, the, the key point. So that brings me to the caveat. So the caveat now is that we have to have this relation. Okay, so it's a little bit uh, complicated in, in the way that it's been written here, but essentially here is our, our incoming composition. And you see here the, the mu i, which is the thing that we're keeping track of, the, the mu i here has been shifted all the way to the top. So the very top row. And also you see that we have also cycled the, the variables here and multiplied the last one here by p. And that's because that's exactly what the action of omega does. When you act with omega, uh, it does that cyclic um, rotation of the variables. So this is what we get. And we want to actually show that that thing is equal to an F where you bring the mu i all the way down to the bottom now, the bottom row of the, of the partition function and such that the, the ordering of the X variables is, is restored. Um, and in the process, we need to pick up this, this power of P. So provided that the F setup that we have actually satisfies this relation here, 
um, we will have the correct eigenrelation for, for this non-symmetric McDonald polynomial. Okay. So the, the, the challenge now is we have to actually exploit the freedom. So, so far we haven't said anything about the way that we choose new, uh, the way we choose the, the Ks, or about the way that we specialize the Y parameters that we have in our model. Uh, all of this was completely arbitrary up to now, but now we'll have to make a really good choice for these such that we can actually get a solution of, of that relation there. Right. So looking at that relation and in view of what I was saying, you know, you want to bring the thing that lifts the top, actually bring it down to the bottom. That suggests straight away that you have to have some sort of cylindrical geometry. You want to just be able to take the row at the top and just bring it around the cylinder. That's, that's really the, the idea that you should have in mind. And algebraically, you know, if you think of each of the, the rows of the lattice as being like an operator, um, the thing that puts those operators on a cylinder is just to take a trace of a product of operators. So if you prefer to work algebraically, uh, you should think in terms of traces now. There's some tracing happening. All right. So I'm going to, to state the cylindrical construction. I'm not going to, to prove anything in detail here, just to, just to really just give you exposure to the formula. Um, so the first thing is the, the Y variables. Uh, we will group them into, into bundles, as we've seen previously, and we will principally specialize. So this, in other words, we're going to do fusion. Um, and when you do the fusion of the colored um, stochastic vertex model, you get this colored cuboson model, uh, which we have seen in, in yesterday's lecture. And I've just recorded it here again, um, just for completeness. All right, so that's the first thing. We need to work with this model. The second thing um, is for those outgoing states, so the, the states at the top of the lattice, uh, we're going to make a choice now. And so this is the choice. So we will, we will demand that all particles of color i will depart from the lattice at the top of bundle i. Okay, so this is... Uh, some choice that we can make. And this is the kind of picture that we get now. All right, so let's, let's look at this in, uh, in a bit of detail. So here I have chosen, we're working with these anti-dominant uh, compositions. So we want, we want the, uh, the parts to be, <coughs> to be weakly increasing. And, uh, <coughs> sorry, I have uh, All right. So we want them to be weakly increasing. And I've just taken some example here where I have two ones, one three and two fours. And we're also allowed to have zeros. It just means that when we have a zero, we don't have a particle. And so in terms of the picture, that translates into, into what's shown here. So here I have my zero, uh, here I have my two ones uh, and so on. And because this, this composition has length six, I should have six, six X variables. And so the prescription that we gave above, um, particle of color I has to leave at the top of bundle I. And so if you impose this on this particular configuration, um, it actually completely freezes. There is actually no, um, no freedom about what can happen here whatsoever. So, these particles here, which have the color four, they will have to propagate across uh, to this position here where they will terminate. And you can sort of start heading down the, the picture and you'll find that actually all of the, all of the particles motion is completely frozen. Um, the reason why it gets frozen is you look at all of these, these horizontal edges here they are saturated um, because they're only allowed to have at most one particle living on them. And here it's, it's completely saturated. So this, this means that nothing can happen on those, on those horizontal edges now. Okay. 
So this is not a very interesting partition function. This is just frozen. It just gives us a, a single monomial of x's, um, which is not very interesting. But we do one final thing, uh, which is now to impose cylindrical boundary conditions. So in the cylindrical boundary conditions, what happens is that every single particle now is allowed to wind around a bundle arbitrarily many times. Um, so, you know, what this means, maybe I can uh, try to just sketch it here. So, for example, looking at this, um, this red particle here, uh, this thing is allowed to wind around this, this bundle here. So it can do stuff like this. And then, you know, make its way up to its, up to its ending point. And indeed, it's allowed to wind, you know, multiple times um, around this, this bundle. So now that you should think of the, of the ends of the bundles as being identified and particles are allowed to, to wrap around. And they can wrap around as many times as they want until eventually they, they terminate in the, in the column where they have to leave. Okay. And the, the final ingredient um, is that the particle of color I, uh, when it winds in the Js bundle, it gets a fugacity of P to the I minus J. So this is the P parameter now. This is the way the P parameter enters the game. And so the claim is that if we set up a partition function in that way, we get a solution now of that cyclic relation. So this was the relation. This was the final missing ingredient. We needed to prove this, this relation here. Okay, so I'm not gonna say anything about, about the way that uh, the way this proof is, is done. Um, so now we end up with, uh, with the theorem. So the theorem is that with the above choice of model um, and for the boundary conditions that we have set up, this F mu is equal to E mu, where E mu is the non-symmetric McDonald polynomial uh, with the composition chosen to be um, anti-dominant. And furthermore, uh, for general compositions mu, um, such that the partition ordering of this is equal to lambda, um, we actually find that F mu lives inside of this space V lambda. So that is to say the, the F mu here would just be some linear combination of, of the E's. But it's only in the case where you have a, an anti-dominant composition that you get the coincidence of those two families. Okay. So the construction um, that I've just given here, so this, this first appeared in in a joint paper with Luigi Cantini and Jan de Geer. Um, but there is a little bit more to the story. Um, so a couple of years ago with, uh, with Alexei, um, we actually managed to extend um, this result um, to the case of non-symmetric McDonald polynomials that have um, arbitrary compositions here. So not just compositions with this anti-dominant ordering, but actually any composition whatsoever. I haven't given, uh, I haven't presented that result here, um, perhaps because to, to state it's a little more um, technical, but for, for anyone who is interested, um, certainly recommend you to, to look at the, the paper and it, it actually makes use of the, the case where you have these rainbow boundary conditions. So that's where you have exactly one of each of the colors present, um, which as we see here, um, this is not the case. So this is not boundary conditions. Okay. And so the final result um, is that there is a way to actually get from this to the symmetric McDonald polynomials. Um, so the, the formula for the symmetric McDonald polynomials, um, I, I, yeah, I haven't really stated it in a very clean fashion here, but um, to give you an idea, so what happens is you put all of your particles now at the base of, of this bundle. And so in this particular bundle here, you're, you're actually not allowed to have any winding whatsoever. And so then the particles enter the, uh, 
into the lattice, and then they're allowed to do the windings and to get these Q fugacity, these P fugacities, and uh, yeah, at the end of the day, you end up getting the, the symmetric McDonald polynomials. And uh, so that's that's basically the the result that I wanted to um, at least give some exposure to. Um, obviously, trying to present all of the uh, all of the details in these talks is um, something that's a bit difficult to do. Um, but I wanted to conclude by, by showing you now what the pictures look like in the cylindrical case. So, so I will return again to, to the, the Mathematica notebook. Um, okay. All right. So, so this was all stuff that we had before. And so this, this function here, this is the, uh, this is the cylindrical Whitaker. So, so now I'm going to, so I'm not looking at the McDonald case. Now I'm looking at the Whitaker specialization and maybe we can put it up with the other one for, for comparison. So yeah, maybe let's, let's do the example here. So this was the, the formula for the Whitakers that we had before. And now I'll put the, this is the, the cylindric version. So here is what it looks like. So, um, so actually here you can see there is exactly one winding that happened here. So this blue particle here, um, it made a winding around this, this column here. And when it does this, you, you pick up this, this power of Q here. Maybe this is not the, the most interesting example if we do another one. Is, is it the case that you can wind uh, arbitrary many times here? Uh, yes. So in the reduction to Q Whitaker, you, you cannot wind arbitrarily many times. Okay. You wind it most because once. Of, because of the indicator in the verdict plates? Uh, it's not because of the indicator. Um, yes, I, I sort of glossed over some details, but in the McDonald case, the, the arbitrarily many times that you can wind, um, this is really computing for your geometric series. Um, and this geometric series just constitutes an overall normalization that because everything here we're only doing up to normalization anyway, uh, once you get rid of this normalization, you actually, you get rid of the infinite winding. So, so the infinite winding is somehow an artifact of the normalization. Once you get rid of the infinite winding, you just have finite windings. And uh, so here, here you only see finite windings. So. Yeah, so, so now another example. So this is the case 4-1. So this one is a bit more interesting. Um, so here we can see, um, let's try and find, yeah, so here is a, here the blue particle did the winding around the, uh, this column here and the associated fugacity you get is Q cubed. Um, well, you can go through these and, and work out the, but I, I think it's, it's quite remarkable because again, in this formula, um, it's completely refined. You get those pure powers of Q, um, it completely splits up the Q Whitaker into, into its atoms, if you wish. Um, and like I said, the correspondence of this cylindrical formula and the, the one that we gave at the start of the lecture, um, I don't know any um, simple combinatorial way to, to relate the two things. I presume there should be a bijection between them, but uh, yeah, it's, it's perhaps not so easy to find one. So hopefully somebody gets interested in, in that problem and might have something interesting to say about uh, that bijection. All right, so I, I think I'll, I'll stop there. much Michael. Um, yeah, people can unmute themselves if they want to ask a question at this point, or you can also put it into the, the Zoom chat. Do you have a question? I have a question. Uh, maybe someone else as well. I don't know. Maybe I'm not the first. No, no go for it. You're the first to speak. <clears throat> you can get rid of the winding two different ways, right? One is to take Q to zero and that's, uh, but oh, the yeah. other would be to take the cylinder to infinity. 
and in in well, I have in mind certain models where such things commute, but here it it it, it makes a difference, right? So. Does taking the cylinder to infinity make sense? Otherwise, looking in infinitely many variables. Uh, you, you want to take infinitely many x variables, yes? It's also natural from the point of view of symmetric functions, right? It's, uh, it's sort of the way the ring is defined in the first place. Right. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if, if that's... Uh, I, I haven't thought too much about computing that, that particular limit of, that, of this object. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I, I couldn't say anything about that. But, um, but yeah, your, your, your point about getting rid of the windings, so of course, if we take the limit um, P to zero, I didn't mention this. Um, so when P goes to zero, we get whole lid with polynomials and that's precisely because in that case, you can't wind anymore. So you just get back to the, the planar representation of, of the whole lid width. So. Uh, hi, uh, I just wrote something in the chat, um, but okay, yeah. I, uh, I I was just wondering. So I mean, I obviously like the point of this is that you're sort of seeing each each term is giving you an individual mon monomial. But I'm wondering if you can kind of like go backwards and group a bunch of these diagrams into like the terms that would be associated to the Q binomials of it associated to a tableau. Okay. Yeah. So in the first representation of the Q Whitakers that I gave, um, so the, the planar version, uh, if you take the, the rank one version of that, so where all of the particles have the same color, right? In uh -huh. that case, you will get the Q binomials and you, you will get just the honest uh, relation with, with the Tableau version. So, oh, so this is, uh, yeah, Th this is true, yeah. However, in the, in the second representation, um, I don't know of any way to, to group them up. So, huh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so Reda had a question in the chat as well. Okay, so, in the cylindrical case, the sum is still one six vertex configuration leads to exactly one monomial. Um, yeah, so yeah, so so every single configuration that that you get gives you gives you one monomial. That that's correct. Um, yes, it's one monomial in everything, including P and Q, right? Not just the. Uh, uh, so uh, are we talking about the, the Whitaker formula here or the McDonald formula? Um, I assume we're talking about the Whitaker formula. So, so yes, you get every single configuration is a single monomial in X and a single power of Q. Yes. Any other comments, thoughts? Um, so Michael's lecture notes will be posted online. I think they haven't yet been, um, and Michael, I sent you an email. They need a smaller version of, of Oh, <laughs> I, guess. I have to compress them. Okay. Yeah. Or if you split it up into the three or something like that. Okay. But, um, the video should also be available uh, later today. Um, okay. Well, let's all thank Michael for an excellent series of lectures. And uh, we really appreciate you staying up so late to do this. <laughs> it's, oh, it's, um, well, actually, I had a lot of fun. Um, yeah, it's the first time, obviously, I did the kind of uh, online lectures. But, um, but yeah, I, I actually enjoyed it a lot more than, than I thought. Which, um, it's quite good fun, I thought. Um, and preparing the lectures was um, also good, you know, revision of, of old facts. So, um, so it was useful for me. So. Wonderful. So it was good all around then. Yep. Okay. So what we're going to do is we, we'll, um, I'll, I'll end this session and, and then restart the next session. Um, the next talk is uh, in about 45 minutes by Greta Panova. 
so I'll, I'll just restart it. You can join um, and then we'll, uh, we'll reconvene in about 45 minutes. So. All right. Bye.